Well, after last week's message, uh, Toby said to me, <laughs> he said, Dad, that wasn't the weirdest sermon you've ever preached, but it probably was the creepiest. <laughs> I talked about the deliverance of the demoniac uh, uh, at the seashore uh, um, uh, where uh, he drives out legion and the swine and all that. Went into a little bit of uh, detail of spiritual warfare and, and things like that. Not, you know, that's understanding. Although it's hard for me to think, you know, he's seen, you know, The Hobbit and Star Wars and all this, you know, creepy manifestations of other beings and whatever. And uh, it doesn't phase, but <laughs> anyways. But there's a difference between the fairy tale and the reality, isn't there? Yeah. Well, I'm going to shift gears, and, and today I want to talk about unity. And that's obviously what the title of my message is, and that's going to be the focus of what I want to talk about. And um, it's something that uh, I really think we can't talk enough about these days. It seems like virtually everything in our society is driving us to disunity rather than towards unity. Uh, but it's a very core element to our expression of faith and love in Jesus Christ. I think very worthy of our attention and, and thoughtfulness. Um, the thought came to me, you know, in order for unity to exist, the possibility of disunity must exist. And, and it's kind of the same thing of love. In order for love to exist, and to be authentic love, the option to not love must also be there. I mean, if it's just a programmed response where there's no you know, choice in it, then it's not authentic. It's not real. And and in the same or in a similar way, just like the devil has a counterfeit for everything of God that's good, he has a counterfeit for love, right? It's it's lust, right? He has a counterfeit for contentment. It's coveting. He has a counterfeit for everything. Um, Do you think he has a counterfeit for unity as well? Is it unity a good thing? Unity in marriage, unity in society, unity in in thought and action and work. Unity is a, a good thing. It's a godly thing. It's a wonderful thing. Well, the devil has a counterfeit for that as well. It's a superficial uh, bonding together that does not have the lasting endurance and leads often to wreck and ruin. Um, I want to read from Colossians. It's in my notes here. I don't have it on the screen, but I want to begin with this passage. Very core idea, um, main theme idea for my message today. Colossians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Uh, Paul says, beyond all these things, and he's just listed a whole bunch of great characteristics and qualities that the, the church should have and the individual Christians should embrace. All these, you know, fruits of the Spirit type things and wonderful attributes. But he says, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. What's the perfect bond of unity? I heard a grunt or two out there. What's the perfect bond of unity? Love. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Oh, I did put it on the screen. I guess I forgot about my own presentation this morning. There it is. Put on love, which is the perfect bond in unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. I just want you to think about where we're at as a society right now, as a nation, as a, uh, as a community, uh, as a political entity, Got the Olympics going on right now. I love the Olympics myself. This year, it's just going to be different. It seems like everything they want to talk about is non-sport related. It's always uh, this polit or this athlete didn't stand appropriately, and this athlete uh, didn't do you know. And it's just not about the sport. So it's going to be a hard year um, to to appreciate uh, that. But just think about our society. Uh, Do we reflect this well? You know, there's a lot of rhetoric uh, floating around in, in our uh, news and in politicians saying that we are as divided as we've ever been. We're as divided as we've been since Vietnam. We're as divided as we've been since the Civil War. We're as divided as we are. We are going all the way back to uh, uh, the, uh, what was that war for independence called? <laughs> the Revolutionary War. I have notes, but I don't put everything I say in my notes. I trust my memory at times. The Revolutionary War, we're as divided as we've ever been. And here we come to this passage where Jesus says that should not be the way it is in the church. The church should be different. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It's clear that there are other things ruling many hearts today that is not the the peace of Christ. So I do like to have interaction with the young people in our service. And so I just have a short uh, quiz today. I'd love to have uh, some help. There's just a handful of you here, but 
I know where you're at and would love to have you participate. What word do we use to describe the unique existence of God uh, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Trinity, tricycle, triad, triumvirate, triple layered. Toby. Yeah, that's right. We say Trinity. And so we recognize as a, uh, as a core fundamental reality that God himself exists. We can't quite explain it. We can't quite define it or put it within our dimensional reality. But he exists. His very nature is a community. And I know that there's a lot of people that don't like the Trinity doctrine, and I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss that with you. If you know a better way to incorporate all the verses of the Bible that describe the character of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that adequately explains how they relate to one another, I'd be more than happy to hear you. But uh, most of the times the people, they say, oh, no, it should be this and that. They leave out major scriptures, or they have to twist major scriptures to make them fit that. The Trinity is simply the best way we as humans can understand and, and experience what the reality of God's very nature is. So he exists as a unity. You, you understand? That's what I'm getting at. His very nature is a united being as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a pretty important reality. It's, this is not ancillary stuff. This isn't like, um, um, you know, third or fourth important type stuff. These are things that are core to the very existence of God, and we are made in His image. Um, three is an important number in the Bible. Ecclesiastes says a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Can you think of stories where three people work together? So think about... Uh, three people in Daniel. Which three people really did wonderful things? Ketsia? See, she got. She didn't use notes either. She knew that. That's great. All right, what about at Christmas time? We often think of three people doing something. Christmas time. All right, I did see, but I'm going to give Caleb a chance. Ketsia. Caleb, who are we talking about here? Yeah, the three wise men. The Bible doesn't necessarily say there were three, but there were three gifts, and so the uh, traditionally viewed as three magi coming from them. They, they do this beautiful thing uh, for the family of Jesus. What about in the, in the Exodus experience? There were three leaders, three leaders that led the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. Who are those three leaders? We know one of them, but who are the three? We're going to give the kids a chance. This one might be a little bit more difficult. I can see you wanting, Ketsia. You're there, but then you're not. Okay, can you name one, Ketsia? Moses. Now, Moses had a brother and a sister, and those are the three. Sebastian. Aaron and then Caleb. Miriam. Yeah, really, Miriam, Aaron. They all three worked together. Now, they didn't always get along. They sometimes had some issues, as we sometimes see in our broken, sinful world. But yet these three each played a prominent, significant role. Miriam led them through the Red Sea um, with singing and dancing. And then, of course, Moses was the, the lawgiver and Aaron was the first high priest. These were very, all three of them are called prophets, too. So very important. Now, what about Jesus' three friends? He also had many disciples and there were apostles, but there were three people primarily that became his closest companions. What were their names? Okay, Toby. Peter, James, and John. See? See all these three? And then the last one I just want to mention is there's three uh, mentioned in Revelation. Not Revelation chapter 3. It's actually Revelation 14. Now, these three work together to provide a very wonderful message to the church in the last days. And we actually have a little artistic thing of them on our wall out in the lobby. What three are we talking about? All right, I saw Caleb's hand. Or did Bailey? Bailey, are you wanting to say one too? Three angels. That's right. Isn't it interesting that in the last days, God could have sent five messages. He could have sent one. He could have sent a dozen. He could have sent a dozen. He chose to do it in three sequential messages in the three angels' message of Revelation. And we could we could go through lots of more examples. And, and of course, other numbers could be um, um, looked at as well. Okay, last question. What does the Bible say is the perfect bond of unity? This is one of those things where the teacher's wondering if you were listening in class to begin with. Caleb? Toby? No. F for today. Ketsia? Love? Sebastian? <laughs> Love! Yeah, we talked about that earlier, didn't we? That's what Paul said in Colossians, that, that perfect bond of unity 
is love. Well, as I mentioned before, I want to talk about unity this morning. During World War II, Hitler commanded that all religious groups in Germany unite into one community. Of course, this was part of the National Socialist Program. They wanted everything to be run through the national government, and that included religion. He did not allow denominations to exist in separation um, from his power and his authority. Most uh, religious organizations did uh, cooperate with the, the Nazi party um, at the time, but some did not. And among uh, an organization called the Brethren, these would be um, those who followed John Huss, in case you're wondering. They referred to themselves as the Reformed Church or the Brethren Church in Germany. About half of the Brethren uh, decided to follow along and, and to abide by the Nazi party, while the other half said, we are not going to abide by the policies and rules and dictates of the Nazi party. Now, you can imagine that those who followed along with uh, the programs of the state and with, uh, with uh, the Nazi party in Germany, they had a much easier time. They had better access to resources. They were able to make to, to have their meetings and, and have uh, uh, access to be able to worship. All those who rejected or resisted Nazi uh, influence um, were persecuted and were not allowed to do what they wanted to do. Now, among the Brethren uh, Church uh, that resisted the authority of, not, uh, of, of the, the Nazis, virtually every single person within that knew at least one person or had someone in their family who would go to the camp, concentration camps and die. Now, after 1945, things changed in Germany, and all these churches had to come together and say, now what do we do? We were together before, then we were divided, and during that time of division, there was great pain and there was great uh, complications. Now what do we do? Do we stay apart or do we unite again? Feelings of bitterness ran deep between the brethren groups, and there was much tension. Finally, they decided that the situation had to be healed. By the way, I appreciate this about the German brethren in 1945, they did not decide we're just simply going to be separate now and forever. They said, we've got to find a way to be reunited. Boy, that doesn't happen a lot today. A lot of times today, churches say, well, I like it this way, I like it that way. Well, you go over there and do it your way then, and we're going to do it this our way. We're much easier divided today. It didn't used to be that way. They decided that the situation had to be healed. Leaders from each group met at a quiet retreat. And for several days, each person spent time in prayer, examining their own heart in the light of Christ's command. So notice this. They came together to a retreat, but before they even met together, before they sat down at the bargaining table, before they began the conversation, they said, we are going to spend several days in private personal prayer, examining our hearts and talking to God about this. Then they came together. Francis Schaeffer, who told of the incident, asked a friend who was there, he said, what did you do then? And the answer was given, we were just one, he replied. As they confessed their hostility and bitterness to God and yielded to his control, the Holy Spirit created a spirit of unity among them. Love filled their hearts and dissolved their hatred. He goes on to say, when love prevails among believers, especially in times of strong disagreement, it presents to the world an indisputable, uh, indisputable mark of a true follower of Jesus Christ. And, and there's many stories like this. If any of you have read The Hiding Place with Corrie ten Boom and her testimony about how um, she came through that experience, this was just a, a, a challenging time, but a remarkable time for churches, uh, particularly in Germany during such a difficult time, but in many places of the world to, to try to uh, uh, figure out where do we go from here? This is a sermon about unity. Harmony and unity among even God's people is not natural, ordinary, or even possible by human standards. Unity is nothing
tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other. They are of one accord by being tuned, not by being tuned, not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers worshiping together, each one looking to Christ are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. As we tune our hearts to God and all of us come together to God, we will automatically be sounding the same, right? Unity is so precious to our Seventh-day Adventist church that we actually made it one of our fundamental doctrines. It's number 14, by the way. I know you all have them memorized and you didn't need to know that. But number 14, we have a fundamental belief on unity. And we also have a belief on marriage and on the church and other things that talk about unity. But we said as a church, no, we are going to set this aside as a key and critical reality. Unity among God's people is paramount to our faith, our mission, and our identity. Now there's an analogy in the Bible I want to draw your attention to and I'm I'm going to be done here in just a minute. You remember back in the book of Genesis when the people united together in opposition to God at the Tower of Babel. And there's an interesting verse here in Genesis 11, verse 6. It says, The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. They began to build this tower in rebellion against God, in opposition, trying to thwart uh, the ability of God to bring judgment upon them. And he says, and this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible to them. Now, even in their rebellion, even in their sin, God recognized as these people are working in harmony and unity with one another, they will accomplish things, even though they're not going to be helpful to them, that are beyond the normal. He says, nothing which they do will be impossible to them. They are one people, the New Living Translation says, nothing which they purpose will be impossible, or uh, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. So God obviously intervenes in that story. He, 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 because of his love for them and wanting them to be removed from this influence that is driving them to rebellion, he divides the people through their languages. They disband. They go their own ways. You might call God a union buster in that, uh, in that story. He breaks the ability of them to cooperate. But now this story, you fast forward in the New Testament. This isn't just a one-off story that we look at. Isn't that interesting? This actually drives us right into the New Testament reality of what God did on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 6, when the people came together and prayed, and they were setting their focus on the Lord and on the Holy Spirit, verse 6 says, and when the sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing the apostles speak in his own language. So God reverses what had happened at Babel, and now he has enabled his church to be effective in knowing and speaking the language of the surrounding nations for the purpose of the gospel to go out. And I can hear the echo of God's voice in the story saying again, Behold, they are now one people again, and now nothing which they purpose to do, now in a holy context, will be impossible for them. And that's exactly the story of the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a record of the unity of the early church. Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. These are all with one mind, continually devoting themselves to prayer. Acts chapter 2. Day by day, continually with one mind in the temple, they were taking their meals with gladness. Acts chapter 4. And they, when they lifted up their voices to God with one accord, and the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. These beautiful verses. Acts chapter 5, at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. Acts chapter 6, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. Acts chapter 15, it seemed good to us having become of one mind to select men to send to you. Unity is the core reality of the early church that made them so successful in spreading the gospel. And every time the possibility of disunity came, they had to come together and pray. They had to meet. They had to figure out how do we move forward so that we are not divided. Again, the text we read earlier was from Colossians chapter 3. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Now, I want to just mention here, this, 
this love, we sometimes humanize love. We sometimes try to translate or, or uh, uh, interpret love according to our human standards. Love is how God defines love, not how we define love. And it's when the power of God and the character of God flows through our being so that our very uh, impulse and thinking is driven by selfless appreciation for one another and not simply for ourselves. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Unity is a miracle, a supernatural gift from God. We need it in our communities, we need it in our families, and we need it in our churches. Now, I'm not standing before you today saying that there's a specific element of disunity within this church, but rather I'm trying to draw this church's attention to the opportunity to come together in greater unity than we've ever come before. Over the next few weeks and months, I'm going to be inviting the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church to be praying about and thinking about and organizing ourselves around a common mission and purpose. This is something I talked about when I first came here to the church. I said I'm going to take the first year, I called it a listening year, where I'm just going to be hearing from you, I'm going to be learning, I'm going to be uh, uh, kind of getting to know the culture and the chemistry of what makes up this community. But then after that, I'd like us to come together and figure out where God wants us to go. This next Sabbath, July 31st, will mark one year of me coming to the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. One year. And I am I'm not the type of person that likes to sit still and be quiet and be patient. Patience is not one of my virtues. And a lot of people have been coming to me over the course of the year, Pastor, what are we going to do about this? And how are we going to do this? And we've addressed certain things along the way. We've tried to you know, keep the keep the, uh, the machine oiled and running. But I've had to kind of hold back and say, well, just give me a little bit more time. Well, the time is coming to an end of that first initial commitment. And I am looking forward to spending time with you as a church, praying together and putting our hearts and minds together and saying, what does God want the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church to look like a year from now? How are we going to be effective in gospel ministry to our students, and to our staff, to the campus which we're on, but also to the city of Scottsdale. Has it ever just occurred to you, we're the only Adventist church in Scottsdale? Do you know how many people live in Scottsdale? I think it's around, well, more than 11. I'm not sure how many it is. I think it's half a million. I think it's 500,000 people. And if we're going to be successful in the last days, reaching souls for Jesus Christ. It begins with unity and uniting our hearts to God. Listen to this, again, from the ninth volume of the Testimonies. If Christians were to act, the if there, if Christians were to act in concert, moving forward as one, under the direction of one power for the accomplishment of one purpose, they would move the world. And we've seen that throughout the Bible. It was a small group of believers who changed the world in the book of Acts. It was a small group of believers up in New England that changed the world and created the Seventh-day Adventist Church and movement. It doesn't take a great host. It takes one community of believers united in heart and mind and purpose. You want to move the world? I'm finding myself more and more unrecognizable in this world. You know what I'm saying? Do you ever look at the news and everything? Again, like I said with the Olympics, I can't even watch uh, even the little preliminaries of the Olympics. It's just so filled with messages I'm not caring to hear about. I want to be part of God's family and God's movement and God's church in the last days, filled with his purpose and love and power. And I want to be united with you. in it. And I want us working together as a family. Is that your purpose as well? Are you willing to commit to that? Well, then pray with me. Heavenly Father, I am just a singular individual and have no special powers or wisdom on my own, Lord. As a representative of you, Lord, and a servant to you, Father, I come before you and bring this congregation before you as well. It seems overwhelming, the task before us. It seems as though the conditions that are around us in our community and in our world are so opposed to you, are so opposite, are so 
foreign and alien to the things that you have taught us in Scripture. But God, we know that you are not overwhelmed. We know that you can take even a small group of believers, even a small group of committed people, draw them together and build them into a community and make them earth shakers for you. Lord, we want to be about your business. Thank you, Lord, that we can come and worship you today. Thank you that we could spend time contemplating this reality. Father, bless the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Lord bless you. Have a wonderful, happy Sabbath. If you're planning on staying, potluck will be followed uh, in just a few moments in our fellowship hall next door. And I hope I get to talk with you a little bit more over there. Happy Sabbath.